I just want to say, say thank you all for coming tonight. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Stephanie. I founded the New York Writing Room and the Detroit Writing Room, which is a physical location in downtown Detroit. Um, I met Susan virtually, and it blossomed into a fantastic friendship and relationship. And she is now one of our New York Writing Room coaches. All so, right. Um, she's helping people with fiction and screenplays and any kind of writing Susan could probably tackle. But um, I'm really excited to hear about her book tonight, Oh Good Now This. And um, if you guys have questions, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. You'll get to ask her anything you'd like. Um, without further ado, I'm going to let Susan take over. She's got some um, passages to share with you. She'll talk a little bit about her writing process in the book. And like I said, hold your questions for a Q&A too, so. My new, my other cousin just came in. Her oh. name is Michelle. <laughs> well, Another cousin. Michelle. Very, I'm telling you, I've never seen all my cousins in one room. It's very <laughs> impressive. And she's an incredibly impressive human being as well. We're very lucky we had a good gene pool. Okay, so here, everybody, you know, these are people, Bill, uh, Peter, thank you for putting up with our community and welcoming oh, and, you're, and you're, you're allowing all of our women's vibes at, to, to, to embrace you. I was um, just saying your glue tape and, and you mend all these lives together. It's wonderful to see. It's extraordinary. One of the things that, that all of us, I think, share in this group is this understanding that Art and spirit are what are going to get us through. And especially in the last couple of years, um, I'm pretty interested in survival. I think <laughs> all of us are. But it tends to be the theme that I've been writing on over the years. And, and the grace of survival. And everybody here, and I bet Pete's got stories as well, and Stephanie and Jake do as well, of how they've managed to get through to the ages that we are and still have a have radical acceptance and radical joy in some way not give up and uh, it fascinates me because you know life can really beat the shit out of you so uh, i was in belize and um at one of these writing groups and um I was talking to this gal and she told me about a labyrinth and I got very interested in labyrinths, which is one of the images in the book as you guys probably know. And um, there's a Kabbalistic chant that you do with the labyrinth, which is that you take the first step and you say, oh good, now this, and you pray. And then you go to the next step and you say, oh good, now this, you know, hit me again, baby, hit me again, which is where this book came from. I started it, oh, a long, long time ago, I, uh, my husband's been gone, as everybody knows, since uh, 2008. And I started another version of it probably in 2010, and I put it down. And then with the help of all these people in this group, um, I picked it up again when I started the Writer's Block in New York City. And um, after many uh, permutations, uh, we finally, Vivi finally came to life. Um, so... One of the things that gets me through that I thought I'd like to share tonight is, is this little pack passage, which really isn't narrative, but it's really one of the things that keeps her going. And I think that um, figuring out what it is that we love allows us to get to the next step. So Vivi is the protagonist of our story and she's a gardener. Um, among other things, because she couldn't really ever do anything else. So she decided that she was a gardener. She lived in California and you have to really work hard to kill plants in California. I mean, things grow just like ridiculously. Um, so Vivi thinks about the gardens that have changed her. There was that trip to France where she fell in love with a yellow and blue tile kitchen just off Monet's sacred pools of Lily Pondy, the water lilies. She remembers sitting under a willow and missing the last train back to Paris because she wanted to see twilight through its leaves. And in Hawaii, above volcanic ash, Jake, her husband, was cranky when they walked there and smelled the fragrant delicacy of frangipani. And the New York Botanical Garden, where she and Jake strolled during their courtship. And Descanso Gardens on the other side of the freeway in LA, where the roses bloom fiercely in all that California sun. She still admires the fact that they make themselves beautiful in all that heat. 
She's never managed to look good above 69 degrees Fahrenheit. The memory of the cactus and drought tolerant plantings of the Theodore Payne Foundation and the Joshua Tree National Park still stun and prickle her with their boulders and spikes of leathery domination. The most important garden for Vivi was in the Massif Central in France again. Vivi fell in love with the mischief, mischief of Claudine in the early books of Colette Billy, and she and the writer became fast friends in the ethers. She read everything Colette wrote. Vivi loved that Colette escaped from that bastard who took credit for all her work and didn't approve of her when she became an acrobat. She loved that she eventually had a makeup line that she sold to aging women. Vivi's favorite book, Cherie and the Last of Cherie, stunned Vivi with the forlorn loss of love and the stubborn, gleeful revenge of age as the heroine presented her older self to her younger lover. He came needing her to rescue him with her need. But when she showed up, when he showed up, she was no longer needy and more beautiful to herself than anyone else. All these tales felt approachable to Vivi, a Midwestern girl at heart, with not enough mischief in her own life. They felt approachable because Colette loved gardens. Colette loved her mother, Cedo, but was never quite sure if her mother fully understood her, like Vivi and her own mom. But Cedo loved gardens, and that's where Colette and her mother met. Colette wrote a whole book about her mother and the way she swatted the bees and tended the weeds and ignored the leathery, uh, the, the beauty and drank in the pathways and labor of her own beauty. Vivi never had the chance to walk a garden path with her mom, except for the Palmer Park excursions to feed the ducks when she was little. But that was enough of a connection for Vivi. In Detroit, at her Aunt Shirley's house in Palmer Park, there was a backyard. Aunt Shirley would call the Salvation Army every Memorial Day and ask for a guy to come and plant exactly 24 geraniums in a straight row against the backyard hurricane fence. And that was the garden. The guy would always show up with a hand spade and a bottle of whiskey in the inside pocket of his jacket. He would fight with the hardened dirt, pull up last year's calcified remnants of plant, and then stick the new one in the same hole. He'd never comb the area around the hole. He left the stones and the gum wrappers and whatever other winter debris had floated in from the back alley. Then he would trickle water over the plants, proudly purchased from Frank's nursery. Vivi remembered it always looked like he was peeing on the plants from her upstairs bedroom window. She wondered if the guy ever played in the dirt when he was a kid because he sure didn't know how to do it when he stuck those doomed hardy annuals in, in her aunt's backyard. Vivi knew she had no real skills, but she knew she loved the earth. She knew she admired physical work and delighted in the investment and hope of a living place that would grow and yield treasure. Gardens are vulnerable to the weather, to poison and to ne neglect, but most gardens create themselves when they are encouraged to grow. What she discovered in California was that sometimes beauty can even be self-sufficient. Water helps everything, but she remembers her first garden in LA growing in full sun with no shade and only, only a perfunctory spray of the hose. Later, she came to understand the lore of gardens and how there are documented fairy sightings and slug battles and snail drunks near beer deposits that are supposed to kill them, but just make them sing louder. Every now and then when she took a toke of some weed that Jake left around, she could hear the snails singing and she didn't think it odd at all. They were probably all engaged in mischief from some form or the other. It's hard to keep things from growing in California, but it's hard to know the rules. And the gardens, like the people, prefer to be showy. Beauty can grow no matter the heat or the water, the temperature or the shade. LA believes in sun and how everything deserves a place in it. Sometimes that works for humans too, but not always, as Jake discovered. It was what he always hoped for, that all that sun and positive thinking would yield fruit. But in the end, Vivi thought, it just addled his brain. There you go. So that's just, that's a, a, a non-narrative section um, uh, that doesn't really tell much about the story, but there you go. I'd like to hear more. That's, that's just what I was going to say. I just want to hear more. Yeah. 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 Want to keep going, Susan? Yes. yes. Okay, I'll read, an, I'll read another section. Okay. And, and this is a section that I wrote in the block with you guys. And um, I've actually, um, at one point, um, <clears throat> Vivi meets this uh, older woman, uh, Amanda, who um, 
whose husband has left her to go to some with some cookie in Martinique. And um, she's she's lost pretty much all her money from the Park Avenue apartment she lived in. And she just inherited this little tiny dark house in the countryside. And um, she moves out to the countryside and she's living there and she has to start again. And she doesn't have any tools. And um, she just decides, well, what the fuck? Here I go, let me give, give it a try. So this is um, a section that I've called painting pine cones. This is the story of Amanda, who is a, a woman who is all part of the game. The debris kept keeps piling up in the dumpster and she still does not feel clean. She finds a can of white paint. She paints the wooden cabinets in the kitchen white or she starts and then hires that kid who stands out in front of the home center looking for day jobs. He finishes, she washes the one front window that faced the tiny porch. It isn't enough. She throws out the curtains. She goes to her closet. She throws out all her underwear, every dress and sweater. She paints the inside of the bedroom closet white. In the end, she has a bed with a, with a white, recently painted wooden frame. She has two towels and two washcloths, and she has a white mug and a white china teacup that her mother had given her on her 16th birthday. She has a white wooden kitchen chair in the living room and an easel and a large slab of plywood painted white resting on three piles of white bricks. And in the kitchen, there is a built-in corner booth with a table, now white, all around it. She decides to sleep on the floor of the living room on a white memory foam mattress. She covers herself with a white sheet in the summer and she buys a white down comforter, two of them. She puts one on the bed in the bedroom, which she does not approach. And she spreads the other one over the mattress on the now white painted living room floor. Her left leg has been numb for about a year, Never mind. She lays down every night careful to stretch it long. No one is there to hear the sighs that come involuntarily as she finally arranges her body on the pallet for the night. She sleeps naked. She cannot bear to feel the synthetic nightgown fabric against her skin. She handles her belly before she falls asleep and tries to imagine it less of a weight against her. There's no one to see her face as she rolls to one side and then to all fours, looking up and through the window to greet the day from her knees, breasts hanging belly loose, eyes clearing. She curves her back up like a cat and forces her spine the other way so her eyes find the window and the road beyond. A cat is somewhere left in her. It's the end of summer. Her house is clean, her clothing is spare. Her bank account is shrinking and she needs, and needs red blood beefing up. And that's when the email comes from the college asking locals if they might spare a room for rent for visitors for upcoming college events. Amanda has no choice. The morning of the email, she paces her house. She goes to the easel and finds the tube of yellow primary. She squeezes a line of magenta, then a line of yellow on the canvas and an angry pile of radish red. She takes off her shirt. She puts her naked breast sagging and easy against the canvas and rolls the one against the other. The colors spread. She places the canvas on the easel, takes her cell phone and snaps a picture of the magenta and yellow, now a bruise above her nipple and stands back for a moment to decide which image is the right one. Amanda does the same thing with a canvas and her left foot, and then her cheek, and then her mouth, and then the quiet opening between her legs, and that is enough. She has several canvases lined against the wall of the living room. She has company, the company she will keep till the end of this time around, and that's enough. She bathes finds clothes from before in the corner of the closet, a dress. She has her nails down and done and goes to the home center to get a white orchid. When that woman from home center, Vivi, naive and annoying, finally leaves her house with all her frantic hope, Amanda comes back inside. She insisted on delivering the plants herself and making a pitch for a full garden. The garden consultation was free and it came with the promise of clearing away old vines that hid the light near her studio, but the woman talked too much and she didn't bring any tools. Amanda makes a pot of soup, beans and rice and greens. She takes down her bottles of rum and brandy and puts them on the shelf. She checks the bedroom, opening the small window for a breeze. The white orchid she's purchased at the home center looks fine under the window. The fern in the shared bathroom perches on the back of the toilet. She finds a candlestick and a half burned candle and puts it there as well. Amanda reads her book until nine. It helps her escape rather than puts her to sleep. Then she goes out into the night. 
Her leg is too much of an impediment for a walk, so she goes to her car, pulls it into the driveway and looks up at the stars. She likes that she lives in a planetarium. Cheyenne arrives at 10. He is tall and rangy and maybe 35. She sees him knock on her front door and then read the note she's left under the flashlight. It says, welcome, please let yourself in. There's soup on the stove, wine on the table and bread on the counter. Please eat and sleep and don't be concerned when you leave in the morning for the conference that there's a woman sleeping in the middle of the living room. I do that every night. She watches him to see if he has any reaction to the note, but he just seems to blink his eyes and, and then enter. She imagines what it must look like to him, her house in the country. She knows now that she's prepared the house as if for a lover and it makes her so uncertain that she does not move from her car. In the morning, she feels herself solid under the comforter on the living room ceiling. She cracks her eyes and looks up to the tall, curious face of Cheyenne. His eyes are an indiscriminate hazel and he smiles. I was curious, he says, looking down at her. You look pretty. Amanda does not have an answer. He continues on his path to the kitchen with a coffee cup, which he must have brought with him. She can hear him rinse the cup and shake it dry. He passes back through the living room and then he goes to the bedroom, grabs his backpack and goes to the front door. He says, I like the art, I'll see you later. I'm walking back so it'll be late. He crinkles his eyes, enjoying her stunned gaze, following him around the room. Then he's gone. Amanda slinks back under the comforter. It's only just dawn after all. Amanda sees the backpack before the swing of his arms, the lope of his long legs. She's in her studio when he comes back to the house. He comes in and she watches as a lamp goes on. He moves from room to room inhabiting her space. She moves to her car when the first star comes out. She opens her eyes large enough to receive each star as an eyedrop. And finally, she loses the battle and her eyes close. He's tapping at the window. He's smiling at her. He says, you afraid to sleep in the house with me? No, not at all. She rubs her eyes and rolls down the window. I like to look at the stars and, and then my eyes close. <laughs> right, and, and you get to keep the light inside your head all night long, right? I get that, he says. She cracks a little smile at him. God, he's a handsome kid. As if he hears her thoughts, he puts his hand on hers, which rests on the steering wheel. It'll be nice to see you later. Maybe we can talk, he says. Sure, she's rattled. I mean, sure, she's rattled. I'm around. Yes, well, you're around even if you're not actually around, he says with a grin. Your house has its own story. Yes, well, thanks, I guess. She looks at him again. He is not letting her off the hook. He is smiling steadily into her eyes and he is flirting with her. It seems like it. I set your bed up. It's all ready for you inside, he says. Sleep well. We can stop there. <laughs> Very nice.